And yes, sometimes we get excited. We get excited. We say amen and we do whatever. But is it really changing you and I? And this is what is important. Yes, we need to say amen. When we say amen, it's about we agree with what the pastor says. And also follow what the pastor says. And not just what the pastor says. He's speaking from the word of God. And the Holy Spirit is leading him. So by now, from the time we spent on live stream, in the church here at Auction Road, Seventh-day Adventist Church, from Sunday till now, we should have grown. We should have grown. And I am just making this to remind you and I that this program is about lifting up Jesus. And it's not just lifting him up there. He needs to be lifted up in our hearts. Yes, so that when people see us, they will know that we are connected to Jesus. So as you have come tonight, we want to welcome you. Uh, my sister, I must welcome you. Praise the Lord for being here. Ne? You play so beautiful. And then on uh, live stream, our family, friends that are on live stream, we want to thank the Lord for you that joins in with us every evening. We're sorry. We know you are early, but sometimes we are late. I hope we're not going to be late for heaven one day. May we get ready. May we be on time. God's time we have is from six. He wants to speak through Pastor Blosset to us. So that is the time we have. And God, you know, when we go to work, heavenly prayer keep pastor. When we go to work, we see that we're there on time. Not even on time, before time. And I do know our pastors have to travel far to be here. But we need to be connected. We need to be ready to receive the word of God. I don't want to take the pastor's time. So welcome each and every one of you as we wait upon the Lord. We are going to be favored with a special item of music tonight. And we ask our group to come forward. Thank you.
talent and we praise the Lord that you use it to teach others and thank our sister for also the item that she has played here tonight. We want to thank the Lord for everything he has done for us thus far. So we're going to stand together as we pray. Shall we stand? Our dear God and Father in heaven, Lord, as we beseech your throne of grace, we become quiet, Lord, to know that you are in our midst. And Father God, whatever will be said and done will be according to your will. So Lord, we want to also pray as we are bowing our heads to ask you to forgive us, Lord, if we have failed you this past day from wrongs that we have maybe done or said and even things we did not even know. So that, Father God, we can be right as your servant, Pastor Bloser, speaks to us tonight. As he brings the word of God to us. May it not just be an excitement now, but may it forever lie within our hearts that the love of the Lord will be revealed to others who do not know you. I pray, Father God, for our members, friends, family on live stream. Pray, Father God, as your word goes out, that we will be ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit. And even here, Lord, as we come together each night, pray, Father God, that this program, this theme of lift up Jesus will become real in our lives, that we will not even need to say anything, but people will see Jesus in us. Come and bless us now further, Lord, and as we wait upon your Holy Spirit, as you have already spoken to our pastor, we pray, Lord, that you will ignite him again from power from on high, that, Lord, we will be touched by your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, pastor. Praise the Lord for you. But allow me to greet the church in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. I have a feeling I might get a better amen from our online crew, uh, a louder amen from our online crew than, than I will uh, from this church. And so I want to greet uh, the guys and everyone who's joining us online at this time in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. All right. Um, I, I, I'm sure that even that amen is nothing compared to the amen that we have gotten uh, from our online uh, listeners. Um, and so tonight I want to touch on a, a subject. It's a bit broad, but I'll try and narrow it um, and also not uh, make it too long or drag it out. And so uh, this will be like a blitzkrieg through something that is usually um, takes a while to, to teach and to, and to preach about. But at the end of this, and maybe let me start with what I call the expected outcomes. What are we supposed to leave with here? I want us to leave this place with a desire and a yearning to pray. Right? I want us to, 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 to get to a point where we can't wait for the sermon to end so that we can go home and pray. Right? And that's the first one. The second one is that I want us to go into prayer without an already prepared agenda. Right? And to allow that moment of prayer to be an immersion into the presence of God so that we can, we can, we can engage, we can interact, and we can connect with God uh, without any prejudices. Sometimes the moment of prayer right, it gets captured and hijacked by our own uh, prejudices or by our own agendas that we prepared before we got into prayer. Are you with me? And so sometimes what God has prepared for us in that encounter in prayer takes second place and sometimes never even happens because the priority is always what we have prepared. And so I want us to get to a point where, yes, we can take everything to the Lord in prayer, but we also are able to experience in our prayers what God has brought for us in those moments of prayers. You must remember that prayer is not just us approaching God, but it is also God meeting us at that point and at that altar of prayer. And so as we bring our cares and our burdens to Him, there is something else that God also brings with Him and that we are supposed to leave with when we depart from that altar of prayer. And I'm pretty sure that we know exactly what it is that we should bring to God, but what we do not know and what we hardly ever think about is what it is that we should expect of God when we encounter Him in that altar of prayer. Are we together? Right? And so sometimes, and I'm sure we, 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 again we've experienced this, that when we go, uh, when we're in a relationship with someone, nobody wants to spend time with someone 
who, only is, who always only wants to talk all the time. They're the only ones that want to talk, right? They talk, 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 talk. You ask them questions, they answer and talk, talk, talk. And then when it's your turn to talk, as you're about to say something, they're like, you know, that exact, that, that exact thing happened to me also, you know? And then they start a long story about how their experience is much more interesting than yours, right? Nobody likes that. Nobody likes to sit. And by the way, those kind of relationships are deficient where only one person only ever talks, where only one person only ever reveals what is in their heart, right? And here's the problem. So there are two layers in with that illustration that I've shared with you. One is that there's this the, a relationship that is, that is deficient, a relationship that is broken, a relationship that is malnutrition, right? Where only one person ever talks, right? There's only one person that ever talks. In other words, this relationship is only a, a, a platform and a stage for one person to be heard, for one person to perform, right? And the other person is subservient, and before you know it, they have disappeared from the stage of the relationship. The second thing that this illustration that I'm trying to bring across with this illustration is that a relationship where only one person's heart and truest intentions are known and the other never ever reveals what, it, what, what they're thinking about and what is going on in their hearts, right? It's a relationship that is bound to die. Hello? Right, so on the one hand, you've got one person that always talks, and the other one is always quiet. On the other hand, we've got a relationship where the other, heart, the other person's heart and the other person's truest and deepest thoughts are known, but the other one's thoughts are never known, right? You just ask them, what's going on? What are you thinking about? Oh, nothing. What's happening? Oh, nothing. You don't look fine. I'll be fine. You never really know what's happening with them, right? And those kind of relationships don't last very long and they're bound to die. Now, God in his word has shown us what is in his heart. God has shown us what is truly going on in his mind. He's spoken in his word, right? And by the way, just as God has shown us what is in his word, the word is not a complete reflection of what is going on with God and what God is all about. It, the word is an invitation to experience more of what God is about. Yet when God wants to meet us in prayer, right, we never want to show him what is really in our hearts. What is really in our minds? Instead, as I said yesterday, we perform this righteousness and we perform in our prayers. Instead, we only ever present before God, as we said in our second day, we only present God the, the storms that are external as a challenge, but never the storms that are within us as a serious challenge. And so the relationship is unbalanced, and that's why we are not growing as, as Christians. It is not because God won't hear us, it is because we will not talk to God. Right? We may have things to say to God, but they have nothing to do with what our lives and with what we are all about. And so there's this misrepresentation, there's this lying and intentional concealing of who we really are when we talk to God. And that's why when you think about church, when you think about prayer, you're always bored. Right? It's not something that excites you because it is a space where you, are never, where you have not allowed yourself to be fully yourself. And nobody wants to be at a place and in a space where they can't be themselves. And because we can't be ourselves before God, we, 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 we are reluctant and we are hesitant to present ourselves before God because in the presence of God, we have taught ourselves that we cannot show up as we really are. Yet on this side, you've got God who shows up as he is. And so the Christian walk is marked by God's uncanny, God's unconditional honesty mixed with man's intentional concealment of who you really are. And when you bring those two together, you find someone or you find a people who are spiritually stagnant, a people who cannot connect with God, and a people who find prayer burdensome. I remember this one time, and you know when you find prayer burdensome, when you find faith and worship burdensome, you become bitter and intolerant, yeah. right? Um, and the problem is not because this thing is not nice. It is because you have made it unpleasant for yourself, yeah. right? I remember this. Have you ever, hey, I'm going to expose myself now, <laughs> right? But it was a long time ago. God has forgiven me. You know when you wake up at, at night and everyone is sleeping, right? And you go to the fridge, right? And there's that ice cream that's that's left there and everyone is gone, right? Then you go to the fridge and you go and you steal it, right? Have you ever noticed that it's nice, 
but you don't quite enjoy it. It's the ice cream that's dished for you and you're enjoying the presence of the whole family. The stolen ice cream is not as pleasant as the ice cream that's given legitimately. Have you ever noticed? Right? Have you ever noticed that when something is not done legitimately, it becomes, when it's not done authentically, it becomes burdensome and unpleasant, no matter how sweet it is. And that's the problem with worship. A worship that is done illegitimately, a worship that is done unpleasantly, becomes burdensome. Now, have you ever washed dishes at home, right? And, and then while you are washing dishes, someone comes and brings an extra dish. Just when you're about to finish, right? Have you ever seen how annoying that is? Right? It is so annoying. You're washing dishes and this person brings an extra dish. And you're just like, what were you waiting for? Right? So what feelings, what feelings do you experience when that happens? Anger, right? Frustration, right? So why do you experience that anger and that frustration? It is because this person has just made longer an unpleasant activity. You're not enjoying what you're doing right and by them bringing more dishes they've just made this experience even longer right why because you don't enjoy it that's why you are angry and that's why you're frustrated follow me closely now right now has it ever happened to you that you were um, at home and you guys were having like let's say swiss swiss rolls right and then your mother calls your sibling and says come get your slice and your sibling says i don't want to how many of you ever said Oh my goodness, the nerve. How many of us met that with frustration and anger? Right? You've got your Swiss roll in front of you, and you're enjoying it, and your mother calls your sibling to come and enjoy their Swiss roll, and they say, no, I don't want to. How many of you have said, the, the nerve? How many of you experienced anger in those moments? How much more when your mother says, ah, because your brother won't come. Here, have his slice. How many of you said, I don't like living in this house? I am made a dump site of Swiss rolls? Right? How many of you meet that kind of gesture with frustration and anger? None. But instead, what do you do? You enjoy it, right? You, you, you go that, 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 that slice of, of Swiss roll. How many of you turn to your brother and say, you ungrateful little brat? Because of your disobedience, we are now having to finish your cakes. Has anybody ever said that? Right? But instead, you almost want to thank your brother. You almost want to thank your sibling for not showing up, right? right? You almost want to thank them. Sometimes, if you're a nice person, you pity them because, oh, they don't know what they're missing out on. Right? But why is it therefore, right, that if you enjoy your walk with God so much, that when you encounter people who don't walk with God, Your response is not one of pity, but it is one of anger and frustration. Why is it if walking with God is like eating a Swiss roll? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. If walking with God is like eating a slice of a delicious slice of a Swiss roll, why then is your response similar to someone who's washing dishes? Is it not possible, therefore, right, that we have turned a a pleasant experience into an unpleasant one. Not because the experience is intrinsically unpleasant, but because our attitude, the attitude we bring to the experience transforms it from a blessing into a curse. And so the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray so that we are not frustrated by this thing, but that we enjoy it. So that we, we don't, we're not angry when people refuse to pray, but we pity them. Remember this one time, it was December, and I like sharing this illustration. And we're in a church like this, it is December in Durban. And you know, in Durban, you get these people who hire kumbis and they go to the beach, right? And so they drive past the church with those kumbis. And a loud noise, and we're in church and we're praying, right? And we're praying and we're praying. And these kids are outside like, oh, 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 and they've got their towels outside the windows. They go, wah, wah. You know, and they're even drunk, you know, like the noise outside. And we're in church, right? And then suddenly, of course, you know, the youth is like, oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> and then the adults can see the youth wishes they were there. But instead of turning church into a pleasant experience for the youth, right, they get angry right and then they go to the front 
right? And then they go to the front. I'm not saying take church into a taxi that's going to the beach, but clearly there's something that is missing which is not enticing in church, right? For those who are in church that they wish to not be in church, right? And so the, one of the ladies stands up and comes to the front and says, let's pray. We have to pray because the devil is attacking us. <laughs> I mean, those are just kids in a taxi and going to the beach, right? says, the devil is attacking. You can see her face. She's angry, right? And she starts a prayer. She says, Lord, Lord, don't be quiet when the devil is attacking us, right? Lord, may you teach them that there is pain where they are going. (laughs) And and then, you know, when the person is praying and you're like, are we still praying here or are we performing witchcraft? (laughs) And it's almost as if we're casting a spell and we're no longer praying to God. But there's something I took from that. That that woman, right, was so unhappy in church that she was angry at people who were happy outside of church. Can I say that again? Right? She was so unhappy in church. Her anger is not that they're making a noise. Her anger is that, how can they have so much fun when we're miserable here? Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this God who has failed to make us happy here. And we're going to send him to them because just as he has made us miserable here, he can also make them miserable out there. Right? And all of this, right, all of this speaks to an attitude uh, that is bankrupt, an attitude that is corrupt, an attitude that has prevented us from enjoying something that is otherwise pleasant. Right? Anyways, let me, I think my, my, my introduction has been way too long. And so the Bible says, and I'm going to run through a couple of verses with you, and just because we're, going, we're talking about prayer. And then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then the Bible says in Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel started, started, started rising up the ranks of the kingdom of Babylon, right? Um, and, 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 and he, Darius, saw the potential, and he appointed him as one of the three officials which was overlooking or was going to oversee three, 120 satraps, right? So but Daniel excelled in all that he did in the kingdom. And the Bible says, such that there was no error found in him. Uh, if you read that, that verse, and, and I, I, I read it for, for, for some young people a, a, few, a few months ago. It says, Daniel excelled in his work, so much so that Daniel did not have, any, did not have the ability to not excel. Uh, do you understand? That Daniel wasn't just excellent at what he did. He couldn't, he couldn't do, in whatever he did, he couldn't help but excel. So excellence came, flowed naturally, effortlessly out of him, right? Such that it would take effort for Daniel to be mediocre. <laughs> but the one thing that came naturally to him was excellence. Yo, okay, does it, do you even conceive of that, right? That Daniel doesn't even need to plan that this one I'm going to excel in. Like as soon as he walks into it, he walks in with an attitude, an atmosphere, a mood, and and, and an attitude of excellence. That is why then Daniel, when he prays, he doesn't do half measures. He goes to his room three times a day. Because if Daniel does it, he he must do it right. Right? And he must do it excellently. Even when his life is under threat. (laughs) Yo! Do you, you, you understand this, right? That, 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 that there's a threat, right? That, oh king, nobody must pray to any other god for 30 days except you. Daniel says, right, I will rather die than not excel in prayer. <laughs> Whew, right? So, so Daniel is actually saying, right, the pain of being mediocre in prayer is nothing compared to the pain of being killed for praying. Can you understand and can you appreciate being so, so familiar with excellence that not being excellent hurts you? I'm not talking about you being sad that you failed when you know you didn't study. I'm talking about acing the thing, right? And then say, but it's not a reflection of what I'm capable of. Right? When everyone says, that was good, that wow, that was brilliant. And in your heart of hearts, you say, that was not a reflection of what I'm capable of, right? And when everyone else is singing your prayers, you, your praises, and you're like, you ain't singing yet, right? Uh, because, not because, not because, and, and it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not this ambitious expectation you have of yourself that is not rooted in reality. <laughs> it is this thing of saying, I'm, 
I, I know what I'm capable of. Yeah. Right? And so Daniel then says, right, I would rather die, I would rather die than not, than not excel. So he goes three times a day and he prays. And each time he faces George Jerusalem. And the Bible says, and he'll pray three times a day. Then they issue this law that anyone who prays to any other God except the king will be killed. Just for 30 days. Anyone who prays to anyone else, just 30 days. Right? If they pray to anyone else, they'll be killed. They can go to the king and ask the king and pray to the king for whatever it is that they were asking in their prayers. For 30 days, you could still go to the king. So Daniel thinks, no, I can't. Right? Because for Daniel, prayer wasn't about making requests. If prayer for Daniel was about making requests, then he could go to the king and make the request. So, when Daniel refuses to stop praying, it is not because he's refusing to let go of a line of making requests. The king is open and willing to grant requests for 30 days. Are you following me? Right? Now the question becomes, then what is it that Daniel doesn't want to let go of? That when he calculates, right, he says, do I get eaten by lions? Or do I continue to pray for 30 days? And he says, which is more painful, being eaten by hungry lions or not praying for 30 days? All right. So that's Daniel's equation. He says, these lions, by the way, are not vegetarian. Right? Remember, the next day, the 120 officials and their wives and their children are thrown into that same pit. And the Bible says their feet don't even touch the ground. The lions catch them midair, right, and eat them. So Daniel says, so if we could estimate, there was more than 400 lions in there. Four, more than 400 lions in there, right, hungry lions. Daniel says, which is better, to be torn to shreds by 400 lions or to not talk to God for 30 days? Which is more painful? So Daniel has to make a choice between the better pain. <laughs> and then he says, I can bear the pain of being torn to shreds by hungry lions. But what I cannot bear is the pain of not talking to God for 30 days. It seems as if Daniel is saying, the lions will kill me immediately. But not talking to God for 30 days means I die every day for 30 days. And so Daniel says, you'd rather throw me to the lions than, lead, than, than place me in a situation where I can never talk to God for 30 days. And so my question is, what is it that Daniel discovered in prayer that made him say his life is worthless without the opportunity to pray? And the Bible says, it's very clear, and the Bible says, and Daniel would kneel, open his windows, face towards Jerusalem, and pray three times a day, as he had always done. In other words, Daniel does not increase the number of times he prays because he's now in danger. His, his routine and the agenda of his prayer is not set by what the enemy is doing. The agenda of the prayer is something to do. It, it is a result. It is a direct result of what is happening between Daniel and God. So when Daniel prays, he makes no mention of what the enemy does. Because this relationship is not about gossiping about the devil. This relationship has everything to do about me and you. And so Daniel says, I love you so much. I'm so, he's so connected. The connection is so intimate that he cannot bear the thought of not connecting for 30 days. You think Daniel wanted to go to God and tell him about what the devil was doing in his life? That was personal. That was, so I want to ask this question, right? Most of the time, when people pray for me, right? There's one word I look forward to. Amen. When people pray, I look forward to that word. And you can tell when someone is ending. And all these 
things, Father, we do not ask, ah, the prayer is ending. You start celebrating, right? And I look forward to that last word, amen, for the end of that prayer. Because some of you pray for long, man, eh? <laughs> right? So you can't wait for that end of that, you can't wait for that word, right? Amen, right? You can't wait for it, amen, right? And something tells me, right, that if we experienced prayer the right way, the one word we would dread to hear is the one word we are currently celebrating. Amen. All right? Because amen would not spell relief from prayer, but it would spell disconnection. Are you with me? Yes. Sure. And so I want that from God. I want to say, I want that, I want that a kind of prayer life where I talk to God and we connect with God that I don't want to say amen. Right? That in the prayer, I feel so connected to God. I'm not talking to the young people now. I'm talking to the old people. You remember that first girlfriend and first boyfriend? I remember those of you who dated during the time of telecom. Cards and you have to have a 50 cent and you have to go to the telephone and clink it in there and then you talk, talk, talk and then before the time, the money runs out, you go, do, 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 do. You have to look for a 20 cent and you throw it in there and you talk, 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 talk and you're, you know, you have 50 cents. You're still on the phone, 50 cents. Ask a stranger and then kids, the, my 2000 are so lost right now, right? <laughs> and you get that coin and you throw it in there. That used to happen. Do you remember now? You remember? You'd go to the, you'd, go, you'd get all your coins in order, right? You go to the telephone booth and you wait there and then you, and then you can't pick up the phone because, you know, you have to call her house number. No cell phones. It's one phone. They always have one phone in the house, right? And then you call the house number. Hey, I sound like a dinosaur. So you call the house number, right? And then it's possible that her dad might pick up the phone. Or her brothers might pick up. Sometimes a brother picks up the phone. Who's this? Hey, can I speak to? Can I speak to so and so? Who's this? And then he hangs up. Oh, you wanna kill yourself, right? Yeah. But sometimes you get you get the person you call for, and they answer the phone, right? And you guys talk and you talk, talk, talk. And then it's like, ah, hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> no, you hang up. Right? All of this. All of this makes sense now, right? Because you've got a cell phone, it's private. Sometimes you call when the call ends on the, on, the no, on the normal line. It's WhatsApp call and WhatsApp video. You know, our homes have Wi-Fi. Can you imagine you've got limited 50 cent coins and you're busy playing? No, you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> Sometimes it's 6 p.m. at night and it's at the, it's at the right at the place where you've got these guys that jack people and take money because they didn't take cell phones then they would take money and sometimes your sneakers as well you hang up but you didn't care about the danger around you because you wanted this person to know that you don't want to let go right? so you hang up no you hang up no you hang up no you danger all around it's getting dark outside no you hang up no you hang up right what was happening there but what was happening there what was happening there what was happening right the conversation was so sweet, and sometimes it'll be sweet nothings. Yeah. It'll be nothing, it'll be, but the connection, the opportunity to just to hear their voice, right, made you ignore all the dangers around you. It made you ignore the risk that your life was under. It made you ignore your limited resources. Why? Because you're enjoying the connection. It was unthinkable to get to that telephone line and find it saying, out of service. Your world will come crashing down. I believe that what we used to experience with Telcom is what Daniel feared the most when he was told he could not talk to God for 30 days. But Daniel delays his amens because he doesn't want to end the prayer for the connection is too sweet. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Danger all about him. The spies of the kingdom are looking to catch him out and he knows they're out there but he ignores it no you hang up no you hang up no you hang up no you hang up windows open the connection what is it that he discovered that we are failing to find have you ever asked yourself that question 
What is it that you found in there? Why can't I get it? I, I want it too. And then, I, I have a suspicion though that what, what prevents me from, 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 from experiencing that is not taking the words of, Christ, of Jesus seriously. Now, let me, let, me, let me go quickly with you. All right, let me go quickly with you. So you remember that, right? Let me go quickly with you to the book of Matthew chapter 6, right? Um, you don't have to open it. You can read it when you get home. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, right? I said to you yesterday, some of the things that block us from experiencing God are this performance, right? You remember that performance? You're going to kneel, you're going to bow your head, you're going to perform righteousness in front of us. When you pray here in front of us, you pray in a way that you don't pray at home, you speak English that we don't even hear you speak, right? You are right here in the front, Elder Marsh, and you are speaking thee, thou, and thee, O Lord, thou great and wonderful one who created the... God knows what he, what he did. <laughs> God knows what he's created. He knows. He hasn't forgotten. Get to the point. Stop, stop, stop. Stop going around in circles. Right? Stop going around in circles. Get to the point, and I think sometimes we go around in circles to avoid getting to the point because the point is unpleasant to disclose. But what if that connection that Daniel experienced is just on the other side of that discomfort? So chapter 5 and says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Remember, I said this, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. I shortly I say to you, they have their reward. You know, some people are very quick and eager to volunteer to pray in front of the church, but don't pray in their private lives. Sometimes, somehow, the excitement of praying in front of the church, they, they are more excited about praying in front of the church than they are about praying in their own lives. No, let me not, let me not put it like that. You... I'm more excited about praying in front of the church than you are about praying in your, in your own life. Because you see, when you pray in private, nobody applauds you for the powerful prayer. But when you pray in public, you then perform the powerful prayer so that everyone can think you are connected to God. Not knowing that that performance is a direct result of a lack of connection in your private place. And it says, but when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Let me, let me, let me. And he says, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of even bef before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, you shall pray. Right? And I'll get to that. Then, then, so, so, so then Jesus says, right, to, 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 here's the best place, here's the best place and the best way to to enjoy prayer, do it in private. Do it in private, alone. Right, let me contrast this, right? This is a linguistic tool. It's not literal, all right? But this is a linguistic tool, right? So when we discuss prayer, it's always about what should you be wearing when you're, when you're praying, right? Uh, should you cover your head? Should you cover your shoulders? Should you, you know, prostrate yourself in, before God? What should you, you know, what should you do? Uh, in, it's all performance, it's all aesthetic it's all outside it's all about presentation right so how should you how should you present yourself before god how should you robe yourself in a manner that is accept how should you yeah how should you show up before god right now someone said to me earlier on in the week and says we're going to go somewhere not not this week but you know earlier on says some we're going to go somewhere and we're going to meet some people i need you to dress in a particular way Hello, I want you to follow me closely here. I need you to dress in a particular way, right? Because the people we're going to meet need to see you in a particular way. So the dress code <laughs> wasn't something that I, it's not what I wanted to look like. It's not really a reflection of, what, of who I am. But because where we were going, I needed to be perceived in a particular way. So we had to get the dress code right. So that where we are going, I'm perceived in a particular way. Is it possible? That the reason why we obsess so much about presentation when we go before God is not because we want to present ourselves before God, but because we want God to perceive us in a particular way. Ah, man, are you hearing that? It is because we want God to, we want to leave God with an impression. We want to leave God with an idea of who we are, even though that very idea is the exact opposite of who we really are. But even more insidiously, right, even more insidiously, is it possible 
that the obsession with covering our bodies when we pray is a reflection, it betrays our hesitation to be naked emotionally and spiritually when we approach God. So we cover up physically because we are afraid of uncovering emotionally and spiritually when we are before God, right? The physical covering helps to fool us into thinking that before God we also remain hidden. Uh, I hope you're catching this, right? I hope you're catching this, right? So, 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 so there are things we do physically, but they have nothing to do with our, with our, with our, with our attraction to them physically. They are really a manifestation of an internal struggle. Right? So sometimes we obsess over dressing up when we go before God because we're afraid of being exposed emotionally and spiritually when we go before God. Right? So we want to give God a perception of who we are because we don't want Him to dig deep lest He gets to what we really are. And so Jesus says, Save yourself the burden of performing, shut yourself up in a closet, and be naked. Now, let me ask you this question. It's rhetorical. Have you ever entertained the idea of praying naked? Right. It's a a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. Like, it's your question. It's for you. Don't tell us the answer. We don't need to know. We've got our own answers. All right. Keep your answer to yourself, right? So it's, it's, it's meant and it's intended to help you reflect. Have you ever entertained the idea of praying naked before God? And you do that. Today I'm going to strip it off. I'm going to be naked before God. Right? And, right, I don't know what your answer is. You know it. Right? And here's the nice thing about you knowing your answer, is that you can't fool yourself. Right? The hesitation to pray naked is directly proportional to the hesitation to op- approach God authentically freely, emotionally, and spiritually. I believe that God gave us prayer so that the parts of us we keep hidden when we walk around, when we are in society and we are within the community and we are amongst people. Those parts that remain hidden when our space is being invaded by other people, right? God then designs prayer. Oh, follow me closely, friends. God then designs prayer as a private space where we can shut everyone out, shut everything out, and only allow God in. Because in that space, we're about to take off what we put on for others in order to hide what we should only reveal before God. And so God says, here you can do what is usually forbidden. Here, you can expose what you're usually afraid of exposing out there. And I think we read Daniel, and all we see are the beautiful, glitzy, and glamorous parts of his life. When he asks for spinach instead of lamb chops, right? When he asks for water instead of coke. When he passes the exam with flying colors, right? We only see those parts and we say, oh Lord, that I may be a Daniel. (laughs) But I'm sure if Daniel was to stand in front of us and hear us say that, he would say, no, you don't want to be me. I have this weakness. I have this shortcoming. I have this character flaw. And that is why I need to take it to God every day, three times a day. Because I'm not just afraid of a life without God, but I'm afraid of who I am without God. There are times when we need to pray, not so that God can save us from the dangers out there, but so that God can save us from the danger we are to ourselves. Are you with me, church? And so, we miss out on an opportunity to be saved. Not from things, not from other people, but to be saved from ourselves. Because in, instead 
of allowing the dangerous, darkest, and most broken parts of us to be presented before God so that he can fix them, we continue this act of hiding things. And before you know it, we are, we, are, we are wasting and dying away, not because of the difficulties we experience, but because of the monsters we continue to become. Mm. Yeah. So when you pray, go into a little closet, right? shut yourself in there, right? and lay it all on the floor. Do you know what fasting is? Do you know what fasting is? Right? A lot of people say fasting is not eating. Fasting is not not eating and praying. They even have names for it and grades. Someone once told me, say, Pastor, if you want things to happen, so the kind of fast you choose is dependent on what, how fast you want things to happen. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, okay, it's pretty cool. Right? So you got to dry fast. Eat that thing. Right? That one, huh? God hears you faster. <laughs> and I go to the Bible and I'm like, but where is it when, like, when God's like, oh ye, oh Israel, hear me now. Should you find yourself without a morsel in your mouth for seven days, I, the Lord, promise, shall hear you speedily. Verily I say unto you, ye, should ye that drink any water, I, the Lord, shall quench thine thirst with my providence. Never, right? It's not in the, it's not, it's not in the Bible. So where do we get these grades and we create this thing, right? No, no, but when I follow up on fasting, right? And I hear Jeremiah saying, you, when you have, it hears true fasting, you take one, you've got three jackets, you take one jacket and you give it to someone who has none, right? And then he says, but you don't give them the one you don't want. You give them the one that you still want to get hold of, right? He says, now that's true fasting. And I try and follow this theme, right? Where like, what, what is Jeremiah saying? And then I see Jesus saying, but when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Wash, you know, you know, marinate your face, <laughs> look good, you know, don't be sullen. What's this fasting about then, right? Because it seems there are these different prescriptions. And I find the common thread in all of this, right? So fasting becomes about shutting out all the things that usually take precedent over your life, the things that disturb and distract you, right? So when you shut them out, Kick them out so that you can only allow God in. Right? Exactly. So people stop eating, stop drinking water, and then sit on Facebook the whole day. And so someone starves themselves. So basically what you've done is just, you have, it's, it's called intermittent fasting. You're dieting. Right? So you've just given up food and you sort of, or you play on, you know, but you haven't shut anything out. You've just, so that's what fasting is, right? And I need to take you through this. So after fasting and after wrestling with God and wrestling with yourself, right, throughout that whole time, what you emerge with from that period is not an assurance that God will do for you what you've asked him to do immediately. What you appear with is a clear picture of your own shortcomings. Yeah. Right? You come out with a clear picture of your own shortcomings and the danger you pose to yourself, your own weaknesses. And then you say, Yay, I cannot go a day alone with these weaknesses. So I need to spend time in the presence of God so that these weaknesses don't overcome me. Are you with me? So then what do you do? You go pray. And in your prayers, what do you do? You, you tell God about these weaknesses. So let me give you this illustration. Then I'll land on my last, on my last point. And when, 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 when Jesus says to his disciples in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. So that's where I'm going to end, okay? What do you mean, pastor, right? That when we pray, it's not situations that change. It's us. That's how you know prayer has worked. It doesn't change situations. It changes us. My favorite, favorite title in the church is Prayer Warriors. It's my favorite title, right? You know the people who say we will spend all night wrestling with God. And I look at these people and I say, who do you think you are? You know, you know my son sometimes says, Daddy, come, let's arm wrestle. He's seven. You know, those tiny little arms. I mean, his arm is like this big. Right? And he says he wants to wrestle with me. Arm wrestle. He says, come, Daddy, let's wrestle. And I look at this thing and I'm going, oh. Why do you think he can take me on? You know, and so we go, ah, and I go, ah, 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 and I go, ah, 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 and I go slam it down. I slam his head hard so that he knows that we're not equal. 
He must earn that thing. He mustn't just be given for free. He must earn it, right? So he comes every day. Let's arm wrestle. Oh, oh, oh. And I go, bah! and I slam it down. Say, you are not strong enough yet. It must never be lost to him that daddy is strong. I think sometimes when we say we are wrestling with God, God looks at us and goes, no. <laughs> the tiny little arms and you're out there and you're like, ah, I'm going to wrestle with God the whole night. Right? And I know where we get that from, right? Let's say Jacob was really praying. The Bible says he was wrestling. It doesn't say he was praying. <laughs> he was wrestling. It was physical. The whole night. WWE or WWF, right? It was physical. It was literally phys- Most of us wouldn't even last two minutes in that wrestling match because we're just not fit enough, right? This guy wrestled the whole night with this angel, right? But let's say that was prayer just to, to appease you and not disturb you. Let's say that was prayer. The whole night they wrestled, so Jacob was praying. And I don't know what the wrestling was. Jacob was saying, I want it. And God saying, no, I want it. No, I want it. No. And then until morning, right? And then in the morning, the Bible then says, then the angel touched the socket of his hip. Right? And it was moved out of it. The hip was moved out of its socket. Right? So Jacob became disabled, disempowered. So let's say that was prayer, right? So then it means at the end of the prayer, right, you don't emerge strong. You emerge quite away of how weak you are. All right. So prayer doesn't leave you thinking you are strong, but prayer leaves you clear about how weak you are. Right. And then Daniel says, no, we're not ending this prayer while I'm aware of how weak I am. Then Daniel says, I mean, then, then, then Jacob says, I will not let you go. Now, the reason why Jacob is not letting this guy go is not because he was wrestling with him for a blessing. The blessing becomes a necessity when he realizes that he's weak. <laughs> right? Then he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Why? Because now I'm weak. You can't leave me alone as weak as I am. And so prayer becomes a way of holding on to God. Not because, we don't, not because of what we want from God, but because of what we are afraid of as a result of what God has shown us about us. And so we say, Lord, you cannot leave me with this monster. Right? So I'm not letting you go until you deliver me from this monster, this mortal body, from this thing that I am. Right? And so God, and then, and, then, and then the Bible says, right, then the angel turns, right? And so Daniel says, I mean, Jacob says, I will not let you go until, unless you bless me, right? Then the angel turns around and says, let me go. The sun is coming up. He says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And then the angel says, all right, all right, all right. From now on, your name will no longer be Jacob. You shall now be called Israel, right? Look at what happens. Jacob's fear is Esau, who's lying on the other side of the brook. The blessing is meant to empower him to face Esau on the other side of the brook. The angel doesn't give him a blessing that empowers him and enables him to face Esau on the other side of the brook. But instead, the prayer transforms Jacob. You're not listening. Why does Jacob need to be transformed? Because the Esau he fears, the Esau he fears, was irritated by the greed of Jacob. So Esau didn't wake up one day and say, I hate my brother. It is Jacob's own brokenness that led Esau to hate him. Now he's coming back to meet Esau and he wants God to deal with Esau as if Esau made himself bitter. Esau's bitterness is a direct result of Jacob's greed. And so what needs changing is not Esau's bitterness. It is Jacob. And finally, God solves the problem. The thing that started this whole mess was not Esau's anger. It was Jacob's greed. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Ah, thank you for reminding me. From now on, you are stopping this nonsense we call Jacob. You shall now be called Israel. Some of us, when we pray, like that old woman in my old church, we, be, we commit witchcraft. We bewitch others in our prayers. Oh Lord, let my enemies be weak. Some of you, the anger of your enemies is not caused by their, it's not because they are short-tempered. It is caused by your own greed and toxicity. You. 
Yet when you pray, you don't pray for God to change the catalyst that caused the problem. You're always sending him, misdirecting him when the real problem is right here. So I'm not letting you go unless you bless me from now on. If your prayer continues to change everything but you, then the God you pray to is irresponsible. For he must not only change the things that you are going through, but he must also change you as you go through them. Has it ever occurred to you that wherever we pray, everyone is bad and we are the only good ones? Yet I promise you, there are altars of prayers where they, which are erected so that people can lament and mourn the things you did against them. people's brokenness be presented in their own altars of prayer. Don't let people pray about your toxicity when you fail to see your own toxicity. So Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Right? We're out of time. We'll do the bread tomorrow, okay? I won't let you go unless you bless me. He says, good. From now on, He'll no longer be called Jacob. You shall be called Israel. And I think I get it. I get what Daniel discovered in prayer. He discovered a place where he could be what he can't be elsewhere. And so Daniel says, I can't think of the misery. I can't bear the thought of, a, of the misery that shall attend me. Should I go on for 30 days pretending to be what I'm not? Sure. You know how they say, fake it until you make it? And Christians come around and say, fake it until you make it. Right? And Daniel says, I don't want to fake anything. I don't want to faith anything. I want to be real about everything. Can't think of a day. Number two, where I'll have to live with this monster. Without God. Seems to me Daniel is more afraid of the he's more afraid of himself than he is of the 120 officials that are plotting against him. I think I discovered I know what Daniel discovered in prayer. And as he wrestled with God God would smash his hand and show him how weak he is. But he'll still hold on to that hand. He said, I won't let you go until you promise me that I will be okay even with this weakness. Did you hear that? And so, when Paul invites us to pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, I think he's inviting us to pray with the acknowledgement of these things. To approach the throne of God I'd approach it boldly, right? Yet humbly, right? The throne of grace, that we may receive grace. Right? We go to Him. We pray to God. We can't bear the thought of saying Amen. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Because we've enjoyed the connection. We've enjoyed the space to be a place where we shut everything and everyone out and only allow God in. I want to pray with a few people tonight here and online. Say, God, I don't want Daniel's experience. I want my own experience. The very experience I've been running away from by presenting all these things that are around me without mentioning all these things that are within me. So tonight, I want to shut everything and everyone out. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. I want to shut everything 
and everyone out. Everything. Everyone out. And it's just you and I. Here I am, naked before you. I know there's nothing hidden before you. You've seen it all. You've seen it before. But tonight, I want to voluntarily show it to you. Look deep into my heart, to the hidden part of me. This is me. This is who I am. And I thank you that you do not accept me because of who you think I am, but you accept me as I am. That I may be as you want me to be. So dear Father, once again this evening, give us a unique experience of prayer. We don't want Daniel's experience. We want our own experience. We want our own experience. We've performed prayer for far too long. We've played around with prayer for far too long. At times it's frustrated us. At times, oh dear Father, it has left us feeling empty. It's not because prayer is filled with emptiness, but because we have emptied it of its meaning by filling it with our performance. And so tonight, dear Father, we ask you for a unique, special experience for ourselves. What we love about you, dear Lord, is that you do not give us blanket solutions. You do not attend to us corporately. You do it individually. So we leave here tonight. We're going to talk to you some more. And I thank you that your ear will be drawn closer to each and every single one of us. I thank you, dear Father, that as we close ourselves up in those private spaces, when we lock everyone out and wrestle with you, you can see that flash of amusement across your face as you consider the idea and the absurdity of us wrestling with you. But, oh dear Father, we really need you to wrestle with us. We might be, not be able to overcome you, but we know you can overcome us. So there are a lot of things that you need to overcome in us. So that when we emerge from the altar of prayer, we are no longer the people that submerged into it, oh dear Father. But, oh dear Lord, when we say our amens, we are not the same people that greeted you in those prayers, oh dear Father. Let every prayer be a moment of transformation. Let every prayer be a moment of reflection. Let every prayer be an opportunity of connection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to thank our God and Father in heaven for his word through Pastor Bloser this evening as he has spoken to each and every one of us and may our prayer lives be more sincere and uh, may we learn from these things and the only one that we can depend upon tonight is the one we should lift up that is Jesus. God bless you Father. We say goodbye to those on live stream and then good night to our families here but don't run away. Auction Road wants to bless you in the kitchen tonight. Amen. Amen.